<clears throat> Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is going to be kind of maybe at some point awkward for me because I'm usually the one that's being interviewed. <laughs> so now I get a chance to turn the tables. I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I, I might just jump up and start laughing. <laughs> but uh, this is really wonderful. Uh, one of my journalistic heroes is here and has consented to let me talk to him. Uh, and I'm Thank just you. thrilled about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Dan, you and I are, are old enough now that people have started referring to us uh, respectfully as, <laughs> as elder statesmen. <laughs> as such, what, what do you think that role should be? How, how do you envision that? Well, I don't know. I certainly don't consider myself an older statesman. Uh, I'm certainly older, but a statesman I'm not. But, but Kareem, I think it's very important uh, that one knows who you are and who you aren't that I'm basically a reporter who got lucky. I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a political scientist, I'm not an expert on geopolitics. I've been a few places, seen a few things, uh, traveled around and covered some stories. And what I hope it means is that uh, I have some historical perspective, having been lucky to live this long. And that, for example, in this time we're living through now, it's a very perilous time for our country. Uh, there are many people who've not been through anything even approaching this before. Now, this is a unique situation, but we've been through so much as a people, as a country before, uh, the widespread criminal conspiracy, which we call by shorthand Watergate, was a very divisive time in the country. The 1960s with divisions over the war, assassinations were a very difficult time. So, if anything, I, I can bring some context and perspective to what's happening now. That doesn't make me a statesman. I hope on my best days, it may make me worth reading. All right. <laughs> well, you know, we're, we're both at an age when we've seen so much injustice, corruption, and just plain evil that we would be within our rights uh, to be cynical. Yet both of us are unwaveringly optimistic about America. Why do you think that's so? Blind faith or something more insightful? Well, I don't consider it blind faith. I don't, I'm, uh, blind faith perhaps for religion, but not for trying to run a country. Look, uh, my, I'm, I'm an optimist by experience and by nature. That's been my experience and it is my nature to be optimistic, but not to be unrealistic. But I do think it's very important uh, to be aware of the word much less the practice of cynicism. And part of what I write in What Unites Us uh, is that one wants to be careful never to become cynical, no matter how, how bad things get. And I agree that bad things are bad right now. N never cynicism. Skepticism, yes. Skepticism is a very important quality. As you know, for any journalist, skepticism is part of what we're paid to do, to be skeptical, but never cynical. And the same with citizenship to be skeptical but not cynical. But because once you succumb to cynicism, there is no hope. And even in the darkest hour, you know, we need to keep hope alive. Thank you. Thank you. Did you ever think you'd see a presidential administration so chaotic and abrasive <laughs> as that of Donald Trump? Uh, no. Uh, but I do think it's important, Kareem, that, you know, we've certainly had uh, presidencies before that at least bordered on and sometimes went into uh, chaos. But we've never had a, a first-term president who came in in his first year had chaos at, at least some of the time that lapsed over into dysfunction. Now, it's, it is sort of routine, rather normal for a new coming, a first-term president, to get off to a slow start. President Kennedy got off to a rough first start, for example, and, and some others. But we've never had one that has been so dysfunctional for so long, and particularly what makes it worse and more dangerous for us, uh, that we've never had one that is in the tone and temper of the presidency that has been so uncivil and sometimes outright dangerous. 
the times when he's been outright dangerous, in my opinion, clearly label, is when he tries to equate neo-Nazis, neo-Nazis, with citizens who are trying to save nonviolent protests, or when he gives a wink-wink to the Ku Klux Klan. I, I'm having a hard time myself. I, it, it's like he is intentionally trying to rip the country apart, and uh, that that he can't tolerate that. Well, no, and and absolutely not. He does this for two reasons, by any reasonable analysis. Number one, he thinks it benefits him, his partisan political him. Uh, that's a lot of talk about his base, and he does have somewhere between 37, 38, 39 percent of the population supporting him. But one is it he is exploiting our divisions for his own personal political gain, and he does it consistently to change the subject. If you will notice that some of his most outrageous tweets, some of the most language that concerns us the most, has been when a, a big story about him is developing. Anytime the Mueller investigation, for example, has a big development, you will see him lash out at someone. Uh, more often than not, it's someone of color. But of nonetheless, it's a diversionary technique. So why he does it, you know, he's very shrewd. I, I think it's a mistake uh, here. Some people say, you know, he's ignorant. Uh, I have known Donald Trump not particularly well, but I've known him since the late 70s or very early 80s. And uh, he, he, he's ignorant about some things, but he does have a certain cunning intelligence. Cunning very calculated the way he chooses exactly. to uh, inject all the uh, disparagement and, and venom in, into the discourse. Yes. But to your question, that what, why he does it, and I, I do think that the central question for us all now with President Trump is what is it that he's hiding? This is, this is the man who's terrified. What you're really looking at is a guy who's very, very afraid. I don't know what that reason is, but he has, by words and deed, he indicates that he's really afraid. And much of what he says to use as a diversionary tactic is to cover what, whatever he's hiding. I do think that in the end it may take a while. We'll find out what that something is. But right now, it's the mystery. <clears throat> America has uh, come a long way from the 1960s when Walter Cronkite was considered the most trusted man in America. Right. Now you can see t-shirts at Walmart that say, rope, tree, journalist, some, some assembly required. What has caused this increasing hostility and animosity toward the press? Well, there are a number of reasons in no particular order. We do make mistakes. Nobody can do journalism perfectly. And when we make our mistakes, we sometimes are too slow to lead up to them. Uh, another big factor, though, however, is that the whole idea of the press as a check and balance on power has been under sustained, unrelenting attack from certain politicians, not confined to Donald Trump. He's done more of it uh, and in more dangerous ways than any president, including Richard Nixon before him. But this sustained attack to discredit journalists as a check on power, it's designed to corrode uh, the public trust in the press, and it has made some headway. It has had some success. And I think it's very important for the for the news consumer to remind his or herself, they already know it, I don't have to preach to them to know it, that news is what the public needs to know, that what somebody, usually somebody in a very powerful position, doesn't want them to know. That's news. Most of the rest of it is propaganda and commercials. But because that's true, people in powerful positions want to undermine the credibility of the press because when we, when we drill down to investigative reporting and find out what the powerful don't want us to know, they don't like it. So we've had this sustained attack. That's one thing. The other thing is the development of the internet, internet age. You know, I'm, I'm old enough to have started in print, gone through radio, gone through television. Now, 
now we're at the post-digital divide, and uh, thanks be to God uh, and my health, I'm still able to practice. But in seeing all of that, particularly now, thank you. So you know, that one, there are so many places that describe themselves as news platforms or journalists. There's so many on the internet. And then you have the proliferation of cable and satellite channels. It's just so much coming at people. I think that also has led to a crisis in credibility for the press. How do you think that the uh, press can uh, redeem itself in, in the public eye and, and uh, regain the public trust? Well, the first thing is to do our job, that we help ourselves the most and help the country the most when we just do our job. Our job is to ascertain the facts, analyze the facts, what some people call connecting the dots, and get as close to the truth as is humanly possible. That's what overwhelmingly most journalists are trying to do. And when we do that job and do it well, we help our credibility. When we don't, uh, we hurt it. That's one thing the press could do. And the other, I think, that the press could do is very gently and in not a loud voice, remind people of what most people learned in no later than about seventh grade civics class. And that is that a free and independent, fiercely independent, when necessary press is the red beating heart of freedom and democracy. If you don't have it, yeah. Yeah. if you don't ha have it, you're going to have some form of deposition. Absolutely. I, I love your description of the no nonsense teachers, mostly women, who demanded your best effort, even though you came from a relatively poor neighborhood. You also describe in your book what foreign school systems are doing better than we are. What improvements do you think need to happen in public education here in America? Well, the first thing uh, that we need to do as a people, as a society, is understand that the three most important priorities for the country are education, education, and education. <laughs> so, so recognize that that everything about our future, everything that we hope for our future, our own future, the future of our children, our grandchildren. By the way, Corrine, congratulations on your first oh, grandchild. Thank you. <laughs> as a wonderful granddaughter. Thank you. No, it's, it's to understand that everything hinges on our ability to maintain an informed citizenry. And there was a time, a quite a long time, for example, when we were the world standard for educating across a broad range of our population. Now, there are other places that we can look to and learn from. Finland, for example. Singapore, for example. There are other places that we can look and, and learn. But if we don't do this, if we don't make education the absolute priority, we aren't going to be world leaders. It's as simple and complicated as that. I've written often about the need to teach critical thinking. In every semester from first grade to 12th grade, the only defense the average person has against the onslaught of misinformation from the government, big business, Russian infiltrators, and pseudo news outlets is the fluent knowledge of the logical fallacies used to manipulate us. Do you agree, or am I asking too much? No, no. <laughs> I, I certainly agree. And you're not asking too much. That among the most important things, having said it's education, 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 one of the most important goals of any school, whether you're talking about public school, charter school, parochial schools, or homeschooling, I'm a product of public schools. I'm a tremendous believer that public schools are, are the spine of our education system. But I have, but I have, you know, but whatever schooling there is, one of the most important things is develop critical thinking. Uh, and I will say that I think in, in previous decades, previous eras, we did a better job of teaching how to think critically than we do now. And one reason is that uh, there's less taught today of the ancients, the, the Greeks and others and the Romans who developed uh, thought about critical thinking and were for a long time the foundation. But again, I'm not an educator, but I do say, no, you're not wrong. You're absolutely right. 
And two, when we talk about improving our education system, an emphasis on critical thinking is an absolute priority. Absolutely. Thank you. You quote Dr. King's 1963 I Have a Dream speech when he said, we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. Looking around at America today, is the bank of justice bankrupt or just very overdrawn? <laughs> I don't think it's bankrupt. I do think it's badly overdrawn. And Kareem, it's one of the challenges we face as Americans, and that is not having a really candid conversation about race. It's one of the most difficult conversations to have in a society. I don't know what your experience is. I know mine is. It's extremely difficult to talk honestly with one another about race. Because having emphasized that, among other things, I'm not a historian, I'm absolutely convinced when the final lines are written about our great experiment in the United States of America, whether it be 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 years from now, the final paragraph is going to have to do with how we handled on an ongoing basis race relations. Uh, that it was from the beginning of the country, it has been a continuum. We've had fits and sorts of progress, we have made some progress, but we have a long way to go, and I'm just convinced that we have to lower our voices, we have to listen to other people, and talk candidly about it. Absolutely, learning to listen is, is one of the most difficult things for anybody. You tell a very touching story about your father being the only white man to vote with a small group of African-American veterans at a precinct meeting, and a chilling story about watching civil rights activist Medgar Evers being refused his right to vote. Today, we're still seeing attempts to keep blacks from voting. What do you think needs to happen? Well, a, a lot of things need to happen. Number one, we, we need to stop listening to those voices who talk about massive voter fraud. The whole idea, uh, you need to keep certain people from the polls. Look, you know, we Americans, we have our faults and we're not great at everything. But one of the things that we Americans are really good at, and, and that is separating bullshine from brass tacks. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the brass tack is, we know that many of these efforts to cleanse the polling places are aimed directly at peeping, keeping people of color, oft times often Americans, African Americans, other times Latinos, but keeping people of color away from the voting places. That's what it's about. It's no secret. And this, the right to vote, seeing Medgar Evers, and it is one of my favorite chapters in the book dealing with Medgar Evers, who was, of course, assassinated in Mississippi in the early 60s because he was such a champion of the, of the right to vote. But we have to be careful. We take so many things for granted in this country. And the threat through legislation, commissions, presidential appointed uh, committees to look into, quote, vote right, is overwhelmingly an effort to suppress people of color from voting. You have a chapter called Dissent, in which you quote President Eisenhower's famous 1954 speech, where he said, here in America, we are descended in blood and spirit from revolutionaries and rebels, men and women who dared dissent from accepted doctrine. As their heirs, may we never confuse honest dissent with disloyal subversion. How important is active di dissent in a democracy like ours, especially today? It's absolutely imperative in a democracy such as ours, and I would say, especially today. You know, I love that Eisenhower speech, and one reason I included a portion of it in the book. President Eisenhower was, of course, a two-term Republican president. But what he was doing in that speech in 1954 was reminding us, dissent is, a, is as an American as the American Revolution. Dissent is as American as apple pie. Dissent has been a very important part of our development. Let's just take one example from many. In the 19th century, those women who said, listen, women should have the right to vote in the country, were damned by, and from every direction. They were called uh, uh, traitors, lack of patriotism, 
extremists, some, in some cases socialists or communists that were damned. But their descent, eventually, it took too long, it was not until the, almost the fifth of the 20th century is over about it. But that's an example how descent time and time and again has been an important part of making our country better. And after all, that's the goal better. Now, in the current time, uh, Eisenhower's words uh, echo, and they echo a need to absorb them and follow them, which is to say that damning dissent is damning a very important American value. And that's one reason I have one chapter in the book. The book's about what unites us, reflections on patriotism. People who dissent often are among the best patriots we have at that moment. Now, let's deal with if it isn't. If it, thank you. Let's deal with the current. This, this controversy has developed about NFL players kneeling. The idea, look, I stand for the national anthem. I stand, I stand my hand over the heart. I usually mouth the words of the national anthem. Frequently, I sort of sing it. I couldn't carry a tune or a bucket with a lid on it, but I <laughs> did try to sing it. But that's what's within me. That, that's what I feel. But understanding what those who kneel are saying, what it is, they're tr the point they're trying to make, and try to seal out the voices of dissent, uh, of division, who want to leap on it and say, well, it's unpatriotic, it's not supporting our military troops in the field, which is not what it's about. Where I come out, it's a no. Look, look, some patriots stand, some patriots kneel. And we, we, we need to listen to one another and listen very carefully to what the Senate is about. It doesn't mean you give up your principles. It doesn't mean that you say, look, I disagree. But we, we at least ought to listen. And what's dangerous about this is that time and again, some politicians, and unfortunately, and it grieves me to say this, sometimes President Trump wants to take advantage of something such as the kneeling of the NFL player, players and use it as a spark to light the flames of hate, suspicion, and distrust. Who are some of the current leaders in dissent that you particularly admire? Current leaders. Current, current leaders, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there, are many, there are many leaders. Uh, I think Bill Gates, for example, uh, has done a terrific job for his country. I mean, he's built a wonderful business, but he's you know, a terrific leader. There are any number of football, basketball, baseball coaches, particularly at high school level and below, who are very important in transforming lives. We have a lot of leaders in this country. If you were looking for political leaders to run down the list, respectfully, I'm not going to do it, and I'll tell you why. First of all, uh, if I leave anybody off the list, you get a telephone call the next day. Right. Well, you didn't have, uh, right, have the list. Absolutely. But I, I, I think I understand uh, I mean, the question behind the question, if you will, which is to say that particularly among so many of our young people, but not limited to our young people, they listen to the president, and as I mentioned earlier, the tone and, and temper of his presidency is so uncivil, uh, to say the least that one does find oneself asking, where have all the really strong leaders gone? And I understand that. But part of what we need to know about our own country, they're, unlike many other countries, there are a lot of leadership positions in this country that one can aspire to. That being the president and the leader of a great university is a leadership role, a great role. Leadership role in business or in unions or in journalism, which you're making of yourself a real voice in journalism. So when we talk about leaders, the the instant instinct is to go to political leaders. We need to keep in mind that there are all kinds of leaders in the country, and that reinforces what we also know, which is important to note at this particular time. No president is stronger than the country as a whole. None, and one reason is because we have diffused and diverse leadership. One of my favorite chapters is, is the one titled Inclusion. In it, you discuss why we need to bring together 
the disenfranchised groups such as women, African Americans, and the LGBTQ community. But you also talk about each group, uh, about how each group faces unique challenges to overcome. Would you like to read from your book? And, well, uh, I would, and I appreciate that you. With you. I appreciate you asking me. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> but you know, the reason I wanted to, and this will be short, and I'll read from the book. I was talking to uh, Tavis this afternoon on his program, and he raised the question that is inclusion enough, which is a fair question. The answer is no, but for those of you who may be following along in your hymnals, I'm on page, <laughs> I'm on page 74. <laughs> and it's in the chapter entitled Inclusion. Quote, we often hear about how we need to be more tolerant to make room for people, ideas, and actions with which we may not agree. This is a prerequisite for a functional democracy, but tolerance alone is not sufficient. It allows us to accept others without engaging with them, to feel smug and self-satisfied without challenging the boundaries within which too many of us live. A society worthy of our ideals would be a much more inclusive one, a more integrated one, it would be a place where we continually strive to create a better whole out of our many separate parts. This is a sentiment that itself stretches back to our founding. Our first national motto was a pluribus unum, from many, one. From many states, we are one nation. And from many peoples, we should be one society. Thank you. Thank you. What do you think the, the challenges are that uh, make that society either work or not work? The challenges facing that goal? Well, among the challenges facing that goal is not to give in uh, to cynicism, to not listen to the voices of division, to listen to one another, to talk to one another. Uh, that would be a start. That, you know, I run across people almost every day now, Kareem, as I'm sure you do, who are really worried about the country. And many of them are, are very afraid, uh, very fearful of what's happening. And that's part of the reality. But we are, we are empowered by empathy and a, a spirit, and this is we haven't always lived by it, but there is within this country a spirit of, you know, we really do need not just to be tolerant, but we need to be inclusive of strangers because they are thus and we are they. And with that attitude, we can make some headway. But I, I do think, you know, among the chapters in the book, I find when I travel around, it's one of the more controversial chapters in the book because there are many decent intending and Americans who are every bit as patriotic as I who take the position that too much inclusion requires that you give up too much of your own principles and your own cultural uh, hard rock foundation. I don't agree with that, but I'm prepared to listen to it. You write passionately about the historical importance of immigrants to this country. Yet, even though most Americans are descendants of immigrants or immigrants themselves, there seems to be an attitude that they are disposable, that they are disposable or a necessary evil at best and an infestation at worst. What can be done to change this? Well, first of all, an absolute, total, complete rejection of the idea uh, that we need to slide from authoritarianism into nationalism and then into nativism. We have seen that time and again. That's, that's the progression, if you will. An, an authoritarian regime or a, re, a regime that leans to authoritarianism starts talking about, you know what, 
This country ought to belong only to those people who were born here uh, and or only to the people whose parents were born here. They go away. That's nativism. And nativism in this country, we passed that a long time ago. We were founded on the very idea that we didn't want to be a country that was so exclusive that it succumbed to the temptations of nativism. And with us, because we are a multi-racial, multi-religious, multi-ethnic background, with us, we have a choice. And I think we're at a critical moment in the process of making this choice. We either slide from authoritarianism to some form of extreme nationalism, either extreme economic nationalism or racial nationalism, Aryan nationalism, Hitler called it, and then the slide into tribalism. If we ever make the complete slide into tribalism, we won't have a nation that's just a collection of tribes. Now, we're not at that point, but there are signs that we're headed in that direction, and we better recognize it, in my opinion, very quickly. You and I share a deep love of books, which you describe as quaint in your own book. <laughs> books entertain me, but they also develop my critical thinking, taught me about historical perspective, and may be empathetic to the struggles of others. Yet reading is, as a pastime in America is slowly eroding under the competition from the availability of video games, etc., on electronic devices. Do you think this will affect people's ability to think critically as well as feel empathy for those outside their small circle? I do, if we're not very careful. Uh, that books have been such an important part of the development of our country. And the development of public libraries, which as you know began in the very late 19th century and accelerated in the early 20th century, uh, was by any reasonable analysis critical to the United States of America becoming the, the emerging economic and military power uh, in the world in the 20th century. But what we do about the, the increasing trend to be fixated on gadgets, what I call gadgets, electronic equipment, at the expense of books, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. But I do know that it's, in, it's never been more important to have particularly young people get in the habit of reading and books. And I'm happy to say that libraries are making a comeback. There was a time when the internet first started that I thought libraries might be finished, uh, but they've adjusted and come back very strongly. But the reason I put a chapter of books, uh, one of the chapter about books, is that an early introduction to the library. And having parents who read, neither of my parents finished high school which was not unusual in their time or place. But they were avid readers. So being introduced to a library at a very early age and having reading encouraged at home, really, uh, whatever I turned out to be, it was very important in the making of that. I uh, read a couple of years ago uh, a book written by Bill Russell. And he talks about how his experiences were. and. Uh, his family had to leave Louisiana. He was still only like 10, 12 years right. old. His family left Louisiana and moved to Oakland, California. And Bill uh, recounts in the book how his mother took him and she pointed out this building to him. And she told him, you're going to be spending a lot of time there. And he was like mystified. He said, what is this building? <laughs> what are you talking about? Right. And she said, that's a library. And that was because in Louisiana, black Americans were not given access exactly. to educational tools. And just having access to library was like a, a momentous thing for his family, right. just uh, in the move from Louisiana to California. That's how prof profound uh, the, the segregation and Jim Crow system uh, uh, affected black Americans in not enabling their children to have the same educational uh, quality as uh, average children. And that, that's one of the reasons that black American uh, development has lagged behind the rest of the country. Exactly right. And why it was so easy to stereotype blacks as ignorant, because uh, just the lack of opportunity. Well, on the subject of books, uh, Kareem, that uh, someone asked me earlier today, had I sent a book to uh, President Trump? 
Uh, well, and, you know, this book is not a screed against President Trump. I wanted it to be something broader and deeper right. than that. And I do think, should he read it, that he would get something out of it. Not that he would agree with everything in it, but I guess so. I think Steve, Steve Bannon and those around him. But I am constantly reminded that, how shall we put this gently, that uh, President Trump is not much of a reader. <laughs> so I was going to ask your opinion. Uh, there is an audio version of this book. <laughs> <laughs> and do you think I should send it to him? <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know. I think he, he's too busy uh, listening and watching uh, Fox News to, <laughs> to pay attention to anything else. <laughs> recently, we, we, recently, we've seen a lot of men in power, including some high-profile journalists, lose their careers over sexual harassment. Were you aware of this pattern of behavior when you were an active journalist? And how, how did it affect you? Well, first of all, uh, in journalism and in almost every other sphere of life, that you couldn't work for very long in the workplace and not understand that women were, in, generally speaking, overall in the main, in subservient positions. Uh, I never saw, I never knew of the, some of the more extreme cases that have been in the paper recently, but uh, I will say that women were subjected to all kinds of things, not, not necessarily sexual uh, approaches, uh, such things as improper touching and that sort of thing, although it did happen, but all kinds of humiliations, if you will. And I, I'm sorry that I didn't speak up on those occasions when I would see something. But I do think now that it is the proverbial time of reckoning. I think very, very lately, it is a tide turning time. Uh, and that going forward, it's going to be much more difficult uh, for men to do some of these things that have been revealed. Now, I do want to make it very clear uh, that uh, these stories overwhelmingly sound true to me. They're true, it's, a, it's objectionable, it cannot and must not be allowed going forward. What concerns me is that while I do think the tide has turned, it may take a long time to reach deep down into. It's one thing for a big corporation or a major network to say, wait a minute, we're going to have education, and we're going to be very tough about this. But where I suspect that it manifests itself in the hardest place to eradicate are small businesses, small places of work, for example, women who make up the rooms in hotels, women who work in small grocery stores, in those small places downriver, if you will. Uh, I think this being practiced on a wide-scale basis, and it will be slower to disappear than it will be in some of the more obvious places. You've been a Marine, and you've covered a lot of war, so you're familiar with the p political events leading up to active combat. How worried should we be about our current situation with North Korea, and how would, how the president is handling it. Well, first of all, I want to set the record straight, uh, Kareem, that I was in the Marines, and probably so. I have one of the shortest and least distinguished records in the whole history <laughs> of the United States Marine Corps. I wasn't in for long, and I never saw combat. The best I can say, I was in, and I was in during wartime. But in answer your question, uh, among the things I worry about with the country right now, there's so many things to worry about that I find in traveling around, uh, by and large, people don't realize how close we are to a war with North Korea, as unthinkable as that may be. We're at the brink. Uh, when you have a president publicly saying some of the things he said, as many times as he said them, as publicly he has said them, uh, that we're very close, and we have to understand the ramifications of that. Uh, as for how the president is handling it on this one, I think it needs to be said that this situation has been building for a long time. This is not a situation that was caused by President Trump. It has been building over a long period of time, actually since the Korean War in the 1950s. As I suspect you know, but I find a lot of people don't, that war never officially ended. That was just to say there was never an agreement. 
But at any rate, it's an extremely dangerous situation. What this or any other president can do uh, is, is extremely limited. That the Chinese are the key. You probably read or heard that said any number of times, but it is because China has the economic lifeline to Korea. If, if and when China decides that North Korea is going to slow or stop development of their nuclear weapons program, it will be slowed and stopped. Until they do that, uh, frankly, I think the best course for a president should be to keep talking to the Chinese about how it's in their best interest, not just in our best interest. It's in their best interest uh, for the North Koreans to at least slow, if not eliminate, their development. Make no mistake, this most recent uh, missile launch, in which they demonstrated a missile that has the potential of not just reaching the continent of the United States, but reaching as far as Washington, D.C. Number one, it was a failure of intelligence, because U.S. intelligence, as well as almost unanimous intelligence agencies around the world, did not think they were that far along. They've now They've now demonstrated that they are that far, far along. And so going forward, I, I see no other way to avoid war uh, than to get across the table from the North Koreans and to negotiate hard. What the North Koreans want, I've been to North Korea once, which does not make me an expert, but what North Korea wants is they want a place at the table, as they put it. They want to be recognized as a nuclear power, they want a place at the table of the UN. They want a place at the table in the trade organizations. They want to be seen as and accepted as one of the prestige and powerful nations of the world. That's what's driving this. That and to keep themselves in power. That the regime is uh, fears that it will lose its power. But this is a very complicated situation. And I probably have tried to talk it to death and not knowing much about it. But the two things are to recognize how close we are to the war with North Korea, and to know that for this and the other president, his options are, in t are really limited. You've also covered a lot of government corruption stories, including Watergate. You said that the current Russia investigation may surpass Watergate as the biggest political scandal of your lifetime. What do you think the outcome will be? Impeachment? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have no idea. Uh, but let me say the following things. First of all, what we call, for short, Watergate, was a widespread criminal conspiracy led by the President of the United States himself. And there was indisputable evidence of that. There wasn't any question in the end that that's what had happened. Now, but all of that was domestic crimes. There was not a foreign power involved in that. It wasn't any question of foreign power. With the present situation, I think it's very important to mark. With President Nixon, the evidence as they was indisputable and overwhelming. With President Trump, we have an investigation and allegations, but up to and including now, we do not have hard evidence. I agree that these most recent developments with uh, General Flynn being indicted and turning, if you will, state's evidence. Number one, uh, this is getting very close to the Oval Office and President Trump because Flynn was a major player for quite a while with Donald Trump, despite their efforts. Number two, Mueller knows much, much more than he's let on. Uh, what it is, I don't know, but there's a lot of it. <laughs> no, no, number three, uh, this involves the Trump family. Uh, number four, we have a long way to go. I don't think this is going to be evident. But now to your question, to reach impeachment, I think the question we need to be asking ourselves, keeping in mind that we don't know what, if any, evidence there is on a widespread basis yet, but. If our worst suspicions are confirmed, turn out to be true, what do we do then, and how do we heal afterwards? Those are the important questions. Now, as for impeachment, this is my opinion, which you've asked for, which I, it's all I can give. 
I do not think that a Republican House of Representatives is going to vote for articles of impeachment of a Republican president, even if it's Donald Trump and even if the evidence is very strong and overwhelming. If there's a change in the leadership of the House, if it swings in 2018, it can change that. But for every person who's saying to themselves, oh, I think he's going to be impeached, I hope he'll be impeached, uh, I've said it. I, I just don't see a Republican House doing that. Right. Now, if the evidence, if the evidence had reached the point where there was a clear case of treason, then that might change the equation I just laid out. Okay. You and I have spent many years of our lives trying to help America live up to its promise to, to be the world leader in social justice, equality, open-mindedness, and tolerance. Do you think that we've made much of a difference? Yeah, yes, I do. I do think we've Great. made something of a difference. But you weigh that against the difference we could have made and the difference we could be making. And that's the American way to say to yourself, listen, yes, particularly in this area, I think we have done, but we could do a whole lot more. And going forward, what we hope is that, and this is one of the things I try to get across on what, what unites us, is that you know we're an experimental country. We have been since the very beginning. And it's always been odds against that we could hold ourselves together. Much of the world when we started was saying, listen, there's no way a, a multi-racial, multi-religious, multi-ethnic background country can ever unite around core values enough to last. Now, in the great sweep of history, we're still a young nation. But here we are, we still are managing to hold it together. And as we do so, we have, we have helped lead the world in some positive ways. But again, I come back to, we always have to ask ourselves, could we not do more? Well, that's something that uh, we're going to have to find out. <laughs> Dan, I want to thank you for, for answering my questions. And uh, we have some questions from the audience that, that we would like to uh, hear. And uh, I think they thank want you, to hear Kareem. our answers Let's about Let's give Kareem a hand. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kareem, before we, before we get to the questions, I'll have to ask a favor of you. Absolutely. Well, I don't hear as well as I once did. I okay. Lost, I lost about 40% of my hearing in Vietnam, and age is taking care of the rest. So if I can't make out the question from the audience, if you just summarize it for me, that'll help me. Absolutely. Thank you. Dan, could you please talk about gun violence in America? What can be done to better frame the story so elected officials have more courage to tackle it? They asked if, uh, what can be done about gun violence and when are the, our elected officials gonna get to the point where they have the guts to deal with this issue? Well, thank you. I'm sorry to say I don't think that time is in sight. Uh, as much as it needs to happen. Uh, here's the reality, that ours is a gun culture, and the best it can be hoped for is to bring some common sense to such things as so-called street sweeper shotguns, which were outlawed for a period, and then under heavy pressure, uh, from lobbyists and others was wiped out. Better background checks. A few of those nibbles, what I would say. But it's, uh, the reality and the reason I said not anytime soon is that on this issue, particularly on this issue, and there's no gentle way to say this, uh, that your elected representatives are bought and paid for and they deliver overwhelmingly. And I don't see any, uh, as much as I would like to say so, I don't see any present prospect of any dramatic major change in gun laws. As I say, it may get a nip here and a tuck there, but that's probably the best you could hope for. I will say, and I, I don't want to be hypocritical about this, that I grew up in Texas, I grew up in a gun culture, 
I grew up around guns. I was taught about guns. I hunted for a long time. Uh, I gave it up not as a, as a moral issue, just I'd rather fish. <laughs> uh, uh, and I own guns. I have my, my father's shotgun, which was his father's shotgun. So I don't be hypocritical about that. But I will say that increasingly, uh, among younger people, I find people under 35, under 30, uh, that overwhelmingly they recognize that something has to be done. And so when I say not any time soon, I can foresee the time maybe 15, 20 years from now. But I'd like to be more optimistic about it, but on this I just can't be. Mr. Rather, it used to be that members of Congress could agreeably disagree and intellectually arrive at some consensus. Now it seems it's all about win or lose. What happened? Where did the train go off the rails? Well, what a good question. It, no, because it, it's a little like sometimes by saying exactly when did a war start. It's hard to pinpoint the precise hour and moment it happened. But it, answer your question, uh, I think it happened primarily in my lifetime, roughly in the period 1967, 1968 to about 1972, 73. Here's what changed. Up until that time, we had some really rough and tumble election campaigns, and campaigns could get really nasty. But the, the ethos, the political ethos of the country at that time is you fight as hard as you can to get elected, and you may even have to go negative, be damning your opponent. But once you are elected, then you move on to do the job you're elected to do. Now, what happened during the Nixon years, and President Nixon uh, bears a lot of responsibility for that, this. That President Nixon, and this is what eventually got him in such trouble with those crimes we talked about before, he adopted the ethos. He was so bitter about having lost the 1960 campaign to John Kennedy and then turn around and lose the gubernatorial campaign in California that with President Nixon, who had tremendous potential to be a president, was enormously well prepared for the presidency. That hate gripped him. It wasn't, he adopted the ethos. It's not good enough just to beat them at the polls, you have to destroy them that the object ought to be to destroy them. And that, we talked about tide turning. That was the beginning of a tide turn, of which then first one side take the view, this was President Nixon's view, this is what got him in trouble because he was going to win the 1972 election overwhelmingly. But that wasn't enough. It was he wanted to take advantage of the moment to destroy the Democratic Party, to destroy their chances going forward. At any rate, once President Nixon demonstrated he could win, and remember, he won twice, and he won with an overwhelming margin in 1972. Then the other side, first the Republicans, then the Democrats saying a version of you have to fight for fire with fire. And so it started at the national level, and then it began to seep down at the local level. Didn't and the, uh, uh, the Bork nomination also it did th it up. Th things like the Bork no nomination, uh, things like uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, later Supreme Court uh, argument, which Anita Hill made, I think, was another factor in this. But the major factor, and we could spend the rest of the night talking about this, I know you'll be relieved that we aren't, but, <laughs> but was at the same time, remember that the, these events we're talking about, that the country is was changing and is changing so rapidly demographically. Remember that the 1965 landmark civil rights legislation was followed on quickly by so-called reform immigration laws. Nobody at the time, or let me say the president himself, Lyndon Johnson, didn't realize. Once we passed the immigration reform in 1965, it opened us up to a great deal more immigration from a wider variety of people around. So very quickly, and this is the point about why things in politics changed. There are many people who, are, who recognize that with the tremendous 
change in our demographics over the last 50 years has come an actual change in the culture. And cultural change, particularly those who benefited the most from the old culture, gets very difficult for Pete to accept. And therefore, it's easily exploited by politicians, which leads into where we got into this question about where, in order, if you can, if you can make it, we're not going to defeat them on their policies. We're not going to defeat them on their personalities. We're going to defeat them because we hate their somebodies. And this is this is spread like mildew in a damp basement, and it brought us to this time where we are now. I have to agree. Um, it's very unfortunate, but that's uh, that's the state of the union at this point. It's too bad. Mr. Rather, why do you think President Trump is obsessed with undoing President Obama's legacy? Do you think he has a vision other than that? Yeah. <laughs> what was the last of it? <clears throat> he, he, do you think he has a vision other than that of President Obama's? Well, definitely he does. <laughs> no, but the question is a fair one because uh, I, don't, I know of no historical precedent for this. Uh, that there certainly have been previous presidents who came in and wanted to dismantle the reputation, the legacy, if you will, of predecessors. For example, President Nixon was fixed on the John Kennedy legislation. Interesting enough, he wasn't fixed on destroying so much the Lyndon Johnson legacy. Nixon was fixed on Kennedy. Ah. For example, one reason that after we landed on the moon, that we didn't immediately thrust forward and say, on to Mars, is that Richard Nixon said, I don't want anything to do with this space program. It's a Kennedy, Kennedy deal. And he wanted to do away with this space program completely. And the best that he could finally do, being persuaded by some of Congress, was to build a space shuttle. But another story from the other day is just that we've had this before, but never, and I agree with you, Donald Trump seems to be, President Trump, uh, gives every indication, and he sort of has a fixation. But I do think, going back to sa saying that he's, he's cunningly smart, he's got a cunning smart business, that he, he recognizes that this is another subject in which he can pull attention away from things such as the Mueller investigation. He starts saying things about President Obama. The other is that, uh, you know, envy and jealousy uh, run strong in almost every section of the society, and it certainly runs strong in politics. Yes. And I do think that President Tr Trump, back when he was sort of saying to himself, well, I'd kind of like to be president, when President Obama stunned the world by winning in 2008, this is what I think, not what I know, but I think Donald Trump said to himself, damn, you mean to tell me that that guy this guy who's African-American, this guy can become president of the United States. It's one reason he attacked President Obama so, uh, so much while he was in president. Who can forget the whole birther movement? Exactly. Which, by the way, he's tried to revive very recently. It's unconscionable. But uh, it, it, it isn't going to be effective uh, in the long run. That President Obama's record is there. He didn't run a perfect presidency, but you know, the basketball coaches have a saying, you are what your record is. And President Obama has laid down a record. And when history gets around to comparing it with the Trump presidency, uh, well, we'll see that same time. Absolutely. Absolutely. This next question, and I, I point out, it came from somebody in Finland who said, Mr. Rather, in your mind, how do you make America great again? Someone from Finland has asked how, in your mind, you would make America great again. Well, I've said part of it before. Uh, mind you, I think America is great now. Uh, we are a great people, and we've accomplished a lot. We're going through a, a very difficult period now. But I, I do think it's very much in the American character to lay out that distant navigational star of always trying to be better, 
This is the core of genuine patriotism, to love your country, love it deeply, be prepared to give up your life for it, but also have a certain humility. Humility is an important part of patriotism, of saying the country's not perfect, we can make it better, we're always moving to that navigational star of having our actions live up to our ideals. But among the things that will make us greater uh, going forward in the 21st century, we have to do something about our schools. I mean it when I said before this, education, education, education. Uh, you know, that's the key. And the other thing is to not lose faith in ourselves. Not lose, not leave the belief in the, the, the core decency of the country. The, the, the spirit of empathy and fairness is sometimes hard to see, but it's deep in our national character. And what will help us get ever greater in the future is keeping in mind what our, what our institutions are, what our core values are, keep in mind what unites us, try to seal out the voices, we try to exploit the divisions. And, you know, I feel very optimistic about our long range future. Awesome. Two more questions. Mr. Rather, what event or interview that you conducted has had the greatest impact on you? What event or interview that you have conducted has had the great impact, has had the greatest impact on your life? Thank you. Well, you know, it's hard for me to pick any one. Let's face it, I've been extremely lucky. But covering Dr. Martin Luther King and some of the early stages of the civil rights movement in the early 1960s, change me as a person. Uh, it, it changed me as a person and, and, and changed me as a professional. So if I had to pick one, I could name another five that, you know, covering American men and women in combat in places such as Vietnam and Iraq and other long, probably, what was an honor in, and, you know, seeing war, uh, for, well, the savagery that it is sounds like not a very good thing to mention, but it was such an education for me. But if I had to pick one thing, it would be the time I spent covering Dr. Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement. That's an amazing answer to me because uh, when I was 17 years old, I was involved in a mentoring program that allowed me to uh, function as a journalist. And the very first person of any consequence that I asked a question to was Dr. King. Uh, in Harlem in 1964, uh, he came to address the kids that were participating in the program. Wow, it's a small world. <laughs> and our final question for the evening, Mr. Rather, we have some high school students in the audience tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Any word of advice or wisdom? Uh, for them to navigate from here through. Uh... There's some high school kids here, and uh, they're just asking uh, what words of wisdom you have to, to give to the high schoolers uh, where they can end up to be on stage uh, being interviewed. Well, uh, two things, and I'm very pleased that they're here. Uh, two things. Number one, don't lose your idealism. Uh, it, as, as, life, absolutely. as life goes along, it's, you know, you have ups and downs, there'll be sunshine and showers, there'll be, uh, you know, bad days and bad times. It's sometimes hard to keep your idealism intact, but particularly to, for a life, in, a professional life in journalism, it's really important to keep your idealism. What we said before, never cynical, skeptical, but in terms of your idealism. Uh, the second thing is to understand that in journalism, journalism is one of the professions, there are many others, but it's one of those professions that to do it, and to do it well, you have to burn with a hot, hard flame. You have to be willing to have it virtually consume you. And if you have that, that burning desire to do it, or if you think you can develop that burning desire to do it, then journalism may be uh, right for your life's work. But if you don't burn that hard, hard flame or don't think you develop it, 
then you probably ought to look at something else. Because journalism, uh, it can be a great career, a great profession. But one thing, journalism when done right counts. It matters. But only if it's done well. And then there's a sense of being part of something bigger than yourself, that you're, you're part of important work. So it can be uh, very good, but it is hell on relationships. You know, it's, uh, I, I would suggest that uh, the high schoolers see the movie All the President's Men and see yes. what uh, Woodward and Bernstein, what they had to go through to get that story on Watergate and nail it down and get it out there in front of the, the, the public eye. Uh, their determination and their belief in what they were doing is so obvious. It's, it's a great movie. Uh, check it out. You, you, you'll learn a lot from it. Kareem, thank you very much for doing this. You've been a thank great you. audience. I thank you very much. Thank you.